It's always good to be invited back. Thank you to inform. I, I gave a speech here uh, a few years back. Um, uh, being invited back, I think, perhaps is indicative that the last presentation wasn't so bad. So that's good. Or, or the management's changed and they haven't passed over <laughs> the institutional memory. Um, I, I'm not a scholar on, on the movement. I, I've studied it. Uh, really, much of what I say, in addition to what I have studied, comes from being a participant of the movement for, I think, about 20 years now. Uh, I was born and raised in London, uh, and after primary school, my parents took me to Turkey to learn the culture, the religion, and the language. Uh, and I was there at what turned out to be a Hizmet stroke Gulen inspired school. In fact, the first uh, Gulen inspired school to be open anywhere. And I was there for three years at a boarding school, uh, quite an experience. And then I came back. So much of what I will say will be informed by those experiences. Um, in terms of the presentation, I hope to give some background because the schools, and although the focus is the schools, the schools come out of a practice, activism, which is informed by values, principles, ethos, teachings, which are interpreted out of a socio-cultural historic context. And so without giving any of that, really the schools in itself will just be hanging there. So I will try to give you... Uh, what will probably be a bit of a meza, a bit of this and a bit of that, but hopefully uh, together it will make uh, some sense. So part of what I will say will be about the background. The second part will be about the schools more specifically. Uh, the third, will I've got three important points that I hopefully will be able to make about these schools and then offer some criticism. Uh, in terms of background, well, it, it makes sense to start off with Gulen, this name that may not mean anything to anybody. Uh, it is a name of an individual, Fethullah Gulen, who is an Islamic scholar, a public intellectual, uh, and a pious observant practitioner. And I think it's those three characteristics that give him street credibility. This isn't just an academic lecturing from the lectern, no offence to academics, but this is somebody that's in the mosque, giving sermons from the pulpit, with the people, uh, engrossed in, in, in the practice that he is teaching. In terms of his scholarship, he's a mainstream Muslim uh, uh, scholar of Sunni Hanafi uh, tradition. Uh, he's not a reformist or a modernist. Some may say that what he does amounts to ijtihad, reinterpretation of Islamic teachings that are open to uh, reinterpretation. And tajdid, a renewal or rejuvenation uh, uh, of, of Islam, which is again an Islamic mechanism. Uh, he's referred often by participants and others as hojifan, which simply means respect to teacher. Uh, we don't consider him to be of a holy status uh, or to be a figure uh, who is infallible or anything of that kind. Uh, a degree of respect is afforded for the 40, 50 years of activism that he's put in, which really should be afforded and is, as far as I can see, to anybody that, that, that follows suit. That's Gulen. Um, he, he became a state-licensed preacher at the age of 18 and was... Uh, appointed as an imam and a warden to a mosque in Izmir in the 1960s. Izmir is the western Asian coast of Turkey. Uh, and he began to preach, and he began to give lectures and visit places, um, and develop a following. Now that following, or the, 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 the participants rather, is what we call hizmet. Hizmet is a Turkish word which means service. And it's really a collectivity of people who were inspired by the teachings and practice of Gulen and inspired by the practice of his met participants. It began, therefore, as a mosque congregation. It evolved into a community of believers nationwide in Turkey. And it's now what I would describe as a global civil society grassroots movement that focuses on education, dialogue, relief, and various other social projects that focus on upward social mobility. In terms of his message, the message that Gulen uh, puts out and has been uh, is, is actually quite simple at one level. Uh, and one of the main things that he focuses on is on responsibility. And his message is this. He says, our humanness imposes a responsibility on us. Uh, and as the human race, we are on the same ship, and if the ship sinks, we collectively sink. If it sails, we collectively sail. Uh, and therefore, it's our responsibility, and we have a duty of care to do what we can for the collectivity of people, for the entire <coughs> human race. 
So if you're based in a particular town, or a province, or a city, the question is, what can I do that is of use to the people here? And his response to that question is, we must invest in education, we must invest in dialogue, we must invest in relief and social upward mobility projects. And that's why in the 1970s he said, we have enough mosques to the mosque congregation. Stop opening mosques. We've got enough mosques. We need schools. We need schools. And these schools must address, according to Gulen, the mind through knowledge, critical thinking, the ability to deconstruct, and the ability to learn how to learn, the methodology. It needs to address the conscience of the, of the, of the pupil uh, through inculcating empathy and awareness and compassion. And it needs to instill within the character of the student universal values. So that's by way of beginning and introduction. Now, more specifically on the Hizmet schools themselves, chronologically they began in the 1980s. The school I eventually attended in 92 was opened, I think, in the 1980s. It was the first school. Uh, and then, after a certain number of schools in Turkey, they then went to Central Asia and started opening schools there. And then it went global. So now you have schools in underdeveloped places of the world, such as Somalia, Ghana, Malawi, Thailand, Vietnam. You have schools in conflict-stricken countries, such as Afghanistan, Iraq, Nigeria. You have them in Muslim countries, Egypt, Pakistan, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Morocco, and in parts of the more developed world, the United States, Europe, London, uh, Australia. In terms of the classes, they're quite interesting, like in Iraq, where there are 20 schools, you will have Kurdish, Turkmen, <coughs> Yazidi, and Arab students learning in Turkish, Kurdish, Arabic, and English. Uh, in Thailand, you will have students of, uh, who are Sikh, Hindu, Christian, and Buddhist in the same classroom. In Bosnia, you will have Bosnak, Croat, and, and, and Serbian students. The school in Bosnia opened during the Bosnian War. They're about estimated because there's no central control mechanism these are autonomous, local projects, uh, inspired and perhaps connected through shared ideals. Uh, and therefore, I can't be specific about this, but in the region of about 1,400 schools in over 160 countries. Now, the characteristic of a particular school, um, one, they're non-denominational. I mean, that's the main feature that you'll find in these schools because they need to be inclusive. You call them an Islamic school, you call them a faith school, and by default, although there are good faith schools that are mixed, um, immediately there are barriers, at least psychological. Um, where possible, these schools will be private, uh, 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 these, these will be non-fee paying schools. So if there is a provision within the country in which they're based, for example, free schools or charter schools uh, or part funded schools, these schools will go down that route so that they are not selective. But where, for example, in Turkey and Central Asia and other parts of the world, there is no provision of this kind. By default, these schools need to be private schools in order to, in order to make sure that, that, it, that it works. Uh, in terms of curriculum, and we spoke about that a moment ago, they are national curriculum-based schools. So they will take the national curriculum in the country, whatever it is. So RE will be taught as it is provided for in the national curriculum, uh, with the exception of bolstering the curriculum with good examples from elsewhere. Now, the values that these schools provide, are they are <coughs> universal values. Responsibility, empathy, compassion, care, cooperativeness, respect, effort, positivity, <coughs> sacrifice, diversity, equality. These are the kind of values and propositions and points of view that the, that the school tries to instill. The methodology is really, and it's, I, I mean, when I talk about this, it seems very simplistic, but I mean, I experienced it. So I, I, I talk from experience. Uh, it's to instill these three examples of the dedication of the staff. It is to support that through mentoring and pastoral care outside of classrooms. And it is to involve the parents through th frequent home visits uh, uh, and, and the updating of the parents on the progress and getting them involved in the school as much as possible. And if I, if I, if I could summarize the, the school and what you would see in these schools, really it's, it's dedication. You see a great deal of dedication, and that pays off whatever perspective, persuasion, inspiration you come from. It's care and it's consistency. 
Um, so that's all I want to say and can really say with the time that I've got about the specific schools themselves. Um, if I may, I'll just point out the three points that I wanted to really tease out. The first about these schools is faith. And I think it's important because when I give presentations about dialogue society or the schools, and I explain that these began, and really today still is, inspired by people that are of Muslim, observant, pious background, and I, and I tell them about you know, the large number of people within the movement are inspired by their Islamic values. And then I describe the activities that they do. People have, an, have some of an issue between marrying those two things together. The, the school is not like this because it's a Diet Coke version of Islam. This isn't a watering down. When Gulen said we've got enough mosques, we need schools, it's not because he's less Islamic. Uh, we believe, and the movement believes, that uh, Islam necessitates this model. It necessitates an inclusive model. It necessitates instilling these values through example. Uh, rather than teaching them as you would teach maths and chemistry. So it's not about, it's not about watering down. And there is a theological basis, and I'd be happy to go into that uh, uh, another time, another place. And, and perhaps you can see this on, on the point of conversion. When you look at these schools, you see zeal, you see passion, you see dedication, and that can be mistaken for efforts to missionize. Uh, because often you may see that with missionary groups as well. There is no research that indicates that this, the, these schools are converting people, converting non-Muslims to, to, to Islam. Absolutely none. The schools have been around for about 40 years now, uh, wide scale for at least 30 years. Uh, thousands of them, you would have seen thousands of converts saying, hey, I'm one of them. And we don't see that, and there's no research that indicates that. I went to the school, I was there for three years. I didn't, I wasn't... I didn't receive Gulen's teaching in any shape or form in terms of converting somebody. Um, and, and, and again, the theological basis for that is that Gulen teaches, and this is something that we use in the dialogue work that we do, that diversity is intended. God didn't intend for us to all be of one religion, as he didn't intend for us to all be of one race or ethnicity and language. And there are Quranic verses that back that up. And the Quran itself says that to the Prophet, he says, you can't force people to believe. Belief is a matter for me. And you must say to people, your religion is to you and my religion is to me. And that, these are, this is the theory. So this isn't a strategic effort to dodge uh, problems that are associated with missionizing. It is genuinely there. And Gulen says that if you open schools uh, that are non-denominational and you engage in dialogue, um, and then within the depths of your heart, wish for that person to convert, then that's disingenuous. You're not being sincere. So that's the first point. And I think this is the magic of the whole thing. Donate to mosques only, to Quranic centers, and to very, very poor practicing Muslim students. And he believed that that's the only, those are the things that will return to him as an investment in the afterlife. He's a businessman. <laughs> yes. Now, the magic of it is, 20 years later, he is now more aged, more traditional, more conservative, but he donates to the Dialogue Society that teaches all kinds of things, including understanding Christianity, Buddhism, the Baha'i faith, and, and more, that has no kind of Islamic <coughs> agenda. Or to schools that, when you look at it, could be a school really founded by anybody else that subscribes to these values. And that's the thing. It's not watering it down. It's changing our understanding of what is Islamically acceptable. The second point is how these values are instilled. I was a very disruptive student at the school, partly because of the cultural change. I mean, changing from primary to secondary is a massive thing. I changed from primary in this country uh, to a secondary school in Turkey that's boarding in, in a completely different language. It was a, a shock to my system, going there and then coming back. Uh, and I was disruptive. I wasn't praying. I wasn't religious. I, you know, I, I didn't have any, any inclination to be of that kind. Uh, and, I, and I didn't really enjoy the regimented boarding school type of teaching either. At one point, though, I remember, I remember where I was, I remember exactly the setting. I felt this very odd feeling. I was like, okay, this is foreign to me, because I feel like I need to do something, not for myself, but for somebody else. And I don't really recognize that, because I have never felt that before. 
I've never felt that before. So I got, and I I even remember looking down at my chest, thinking, what's going on here? And at the time, they were running, the the mayor of the city was running this clean, the Gulf uh, campaign. The Izmir Gulf used to stink, and they were running this campaign. And some students came along, and I donated all the money I had in my pocket to the amusement and the bewilderment of everyone concerned. And I even donated the money that I had given for safekeeping. And as a result, they had to take me, the most disruptive student in the school, to meet the mayor. And because I was the kind of student I was, they had to to give me a jacket, they had to polish my shoes because I couldn't go in the state that I looked. But the thing I'm trying to say is, as a disruptive student, and without any of this formalized teaching, I had picked something up. Sacrifice. That I needed to do something. And I I saw that in, in the practice of the people. And not just... Not just the staff and the mentors, but other students. There was one in particular who was a couple of years older than me, who's been, uh, who'd come from Sydney and I came from London. And he was smart, he was sporty, he was social, and he was sacrificing. And he was spiritual. And that stayed with me. And that had a lasting impact. Now, he wasn't doing that for the sake of doing it. He was another student. But those kind of values and the power of example is quite transformative. The key is that you do it as part of a natural, inadvertent overspill. Because if you go in there saying, well, hey, I'm going to now influence you through the power of the example, then it's no longer sincere. And people pick up on that. Especially students like myself um, at the time. The third point is about de-radicalization. I came back and I went through a massive identity crisis at the age of 14. I didn't know who I was. Um, I became very confrontational. I started to force people to go to Friday prayer with me. A friend agreed, went for a few years, and the mother freaked out when she found out that her son was bunking school, forgive the terminology, every Friday to go to, 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 to pray, and he wasn't even obligated to do so. Um, that's, and I, and I, I felt that I needed to do that because um, I, I felt that that anchored me in my identity. I eventually came in touch with Gulen's teachings when I came back. I married that with the values that I saw when I was at the school, and then I became more calm, uh, and, and comfortable in my skin and, and in my identity. That was at the age of 16. Now, I was now going to a state comprehensive in Haringey. A maths teacher started that school at the state comprehensive, and he turned out to be a member of a politicized, uh, political Islamic, uh, and, and some may describe extremist group. And he tried to recruit me. He called me to rallies. We started organizing Friday sermons. And I'm... I, I, I was able to withstand the, 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 the attractiveness of the binary world view that he was offering me, the kuffar and the Muslims, and we need to do something, and the way to do it is to fight, and so forth. And political Islam is the way to go. I was able to withstand that because of the values that I had picked up in the school, which I, with which I married with the teachings that I later came in touch. <laughs> because those values are, are mutually exclusive with extremist ideology. Now, points of criticism... And I'll take a sip, if I may. One. Uh, The movement moves, and it it speaks through its movement, through its action. Um, And that's great, because while you're thinking of it, they're doing it. It's very dynamic. They don't often think things through, which causes problems later on. But they need to extrapolate. The movement needs to extrapolate from its practice the methodology and, and, and articulate that. And, and, and in particular with the schools, I think that would be very useful because it would be easier for me to give a presentation to people like yourselves. Um, and, and I think that's something that the schools need to do. The second thing, uh, there needs to be more cross fertilization between the schools in Turkey, United States, Australia, uh, Central Asia, parts of Africa, because there's great practices in all of these places. Um, but there's not, there's not, because of the lack of centralized coordination, there's no cross fertilize there isn't enough cross fertilization. They need to replace this emphasis on Olympiad, science Olympiad uh, uh, competitions with other forms of rewarding uh, uh, forms of, uh, 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 of competitions. I think that comes from Turkey, because in there the, the mentality is all test-based, exam-based, and I think the movement can only jump so far from that particular context. It, need, it now needs to jump further uh, away, uh, I think, from that. I think there needs to be more emphasis in these schools on the social sciences, on the humanities. Again, part of, I think, uh, Turkey's experience is 
that there's more emphasis on the engineering and students are certainly uh, uh, encouraged that way. Uh, um, yeah, so I think those are some of the criticisms that I would have expanded on if I had a bit more time, but there you go. Thank you.